How much do you know about the history of St John's? Like, when was the church built? 1857. So, how old is the building? Mm, is maths your strong point? 165 years. Was it always this shape? No, it wasn't. The aisles were added later. So when was it widened? 1957, 100 years after it was first built. And why was it built here? Now that's a very interesting question. This map is based upon the 1902-1903 Ordnance Survey map for this area, about 50 years after the church was built. And it's hard to overstate just how much St John the Evangelist was built in the middle of nowhere. At that time, Newbold, Whittington, Brimington were not part of Chesterfield. According to the official history of the church, the new church was prompted by the growth of Whittington Moor, which you can see on the right uh, on what is we now know as Sheffield Road. And by about 1851, the population of this part of new part of Chesterfield or Whittington Moor had grown to about 2000. The houses were built to serve the various collieries and works that had grown up. You can see a few of the collieries marked on the map. And so, according to the official history, the church was built halfway between the new population of Whittington Moor and the village of Newbold, so it could serve both. But just think of a different theory. There were four main benefactors who paid for the new church. There was Bernard Maynard Lucas, who lived at Highfield Hall. He was the main benefactor. But the others were the Reverend Alexander Crawford Broomhead, who lived at Newbold House, the Smith Milnes family that lived at Dunstan Hall, and the people who lived at Dunstan Grange. And just look how convenient the new church is for all those four households. Let's not be too hard on them though. The church cost £2,300 to build. Doesn't seem a lot. But then they also paid for the rectory, which was opened at the same time as the church, and the new school, which was, there was an existing school in Newbold village, and they paid for the new school adjacent to the rectory, what we now know as the Eagle Club. And just looking at how much it's costing for us to replace the parish room, those four benefactors must have paid out one to two million, if not more, in modern money. So, has the church always looked like it does today? This is a really interesting picture which Ina found. It shows the interior of the church probably in the 1920s, when the church was still very rural. All the housing that we now know hadn't been built by then. There were no aisles, so it was before it was widened. There was one altar at the end. The lectern looks much the same, but the pulpit's changed. And there's pews and no rood screen. Now, one of the features in the church are memorials. And there are quite a few of them in the church. Here are just a few. Here's the memorial for the opening of the church by John Lonsdale, the Bishop of Lichfield. This memorial is to Bernard Maynard Lucas, that I mentioned before. Calls him the principal contributor in the erection of this church. And the east window that we now have was 
built to uh, commemorate him. And here's the main memorial, not the only one, to the Crawford Broomhead family. Somewhere along the line they became orange broomheads and they continued to support the church until they left the area. Here's another example of a, uh, a memorial for the Crawford Broomheads. This is a memorial to the third rector, Llewellyn Charles Cutlack, and the rood screen was erected in his memory. This memorial doesn't mention anybody by name, but it commemorates the widening of the church, the completion of the two aisles, the North and South Isle that we can see today. I've no idea what these are, but they're rather nice and they're in the porch. Probably somebody knows, but I must admit I don't. And lastly, there's this memorial to Richard Knott Bolton, who was the first rector of this parish, who was here for what, 32 years quite a long service to the church. There are many other memorials in the church. I've gone round, I've counted 31, I might have missed one. Those are just the memorials on display. There are other um, memorials in hymn books and so on. But 31 at least memorials to various people across the ages. That's briefly the history of our church. A reading from Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 20 and this is taken from the version of the Bible known as the Message which was translated by Eugene Peterson. We look at this sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organises and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and, leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From the beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so expansive, that everything of God finds its proper place in him, without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. What is the church? Is this the church? No, this is the church building. Is this the church? Yes, this is the church. The people. We are the church. Earlier I talked about all the memorials that you can find in the church to many people who did many things that went before. Benefactors, clergy, church warden, everyone else dedicated to this church created the community that we now inherit. But we must not forget the most important person who went before every single one of us. Jesus. 
In the Colossians reading it says, When it comes to the church, he organises and holds it together like a head does a body. I love this picture. From a distance it looks like the head of Christ. Close up you can see all the people that make up the body of Christ. What we have in this church is the most important gift God has ever given to humankind, his son. We are only here because he died for us and rose again. And he did all that because he loves us. We share that love within our church community. And it's our job to pass on that love to new generations. Just as the previous generations who have worshipped in this church building and others like it have passed on his love to us. Amen.